on Zoom. Just yeah, and you could do it. So I don't have anybody on Zoom yet to tell me whether they can see it or not. So let's, yeah. The things I've had to learn. Oh, yeah, I look good. I was out in the wind all day. I, I, I was in the landing barn at 5.30 this morning. And it's like, I, I came in and I looked like the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> my hair was all over the place. I had straw in my hair. I was like, it's not about beauty anymore for me. It's all fine. That's how you want to play your game. All right. Every time I come in here, I swear someone else has messed with this. And then I get to kind of like reinvent the wheel. You do? Are you picking it up? Okay, good. You're good. You're good to go. We'll get James. Here's for them. A lot of people don't remember. I don't think there's anything to help us remember. <laughs> I know, I know, I was. It was an interesting morning. Um, I'll tell you about it either after class or I'll come in and have some chocolate and I'll, I'll tell you how bad it is. <laughs> Sure. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, you do what you have as well. I can. I can try this. Let's try this. Let's fix this one. You don't have to use this. This is what we have. This is what we have. So, you know, the people on Zoom don't care. Sorry. Only a five hours. Well, yeah, I mean, they just get that plus the next slide. Yeah. So. That's not a bad thing. That's I just didn't know if you can constantly do slideshows. I don't have any notes. Okay. I, you are good. You are good to go. This is working. Yeah, I have my online people too, and I, I'm sure that they're going to have a look around. Oh, yeah, I closed captions and I just, oh boy, so no flares. <laughs> Can I back up one? How do I back up? Can you see this little here? Yeah. Oh. You can either touch it. Oh, you can. Or you can click it, whichever one works for you. Okay. Perfect. So, were you out driving today? No. I speed this. 
So we decided we can't. Based on the forecast. Can you uh, represent? CDO. Oh. Crazy. Crazy weather. Oh, there's two out there. Because when I closed the curtains, there was two. <laughs> to, to that last part, this line that really describes you. Playing <laughs> about it. Right. There's a construction on the road. Well, it's like a high road one for the second to a super highway. And it's like, I get chased you down there. Yeah. Thank you. 
You guys will be so annoyed so much. I'm going to go to the crew button and I'll be ready. Do I need to let people on or just remember? No, I, I have a waiting list. I'm sorry. Yeah. So are you joining the call? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But a very small
Where do you live? Um, over by nice okay. Okay. So north. north. Yeah. Used to be called Oh yeah. Yeah. How's your soil? Yeah. Is it? Well, yeah. Well, sometimes you can surprise yourself. There's, there's some advantages. Yeah. You're a raised bed. Boy, the winter has been something else. That's it. Yep. I mean, I grew up here in Bowie, and we haven't had a normal winter in a long time. Yeah. It really was. Where did you move from? Were you in Albuquerque? Were you in Albuquerque? No. Oh. Oh. So my friends from Germany in Albuquerque, so they were in Carl. We moved to them for a nice
Good evening, everybody. We get started here. Welcome to class. Uh, tonight's class is on herbs, and it's going to be taught by Susan Allen. And I will introduce her when she comes back. But I'm also happy to be the Master Gardener Director for the class of 2023. So this is where you get to have a chance to. There's always going to be an error in that. So I'm going to hand out this little catalog, and Rickers is just one of several group companies. This one happens to have a catalog that's a wealth of information in it. It's based out of Canada. I've been ordering from them for six years, so they didn't get the cross the border. There's another couple more herb companies, one in California. A couple in California, Washington, uh, seed favors have changed. So there's there's a lot of other choices for getting herbs. But the, what I like about this catalog is that you can learn a lot about the herbs just by going through the catalog. So for example, go to page five in your Richards catalog. So they talk about aloe vera on the column on the right. They give you that it's a perennial, well, it's a house plant perennial. <laughs> it's a pretty kind of tough growing year. There's going to be a lot of things that aren't going to make it. Anything done by is probably not going to make it. But it does tell you the zones 10 through 11. So and we're Zone four, so not going to make it here. This well known healing plant, the fresh gel from the leaves of the bud is one of the burn, sunburns, wrinkles, insect bites, one of the fat scabs, irritation. The juice is used internally for ulcers, growth indoors, and good light. So, this is one of the reasons why I like this catalog so much. It tells you in the description what it's good for, um, how to use it. How to grow it, grow indoors in good light. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but right indirect light, full light. I see some aloe vera still on 15th Street and around the business council window when it's wide or sitting in the window. So that's why it's so much temporary accessible. Tells you the zones, tells you the they're used for. Culinary, medicinal, beverage, aromatic, industrial, poisonous. That's really good to know because on that same page five, that's one, left column, that's growth here. The wall at the end. It's a beautiful plant, monk's bud. Historically been used for centuries in a medicinal herb with street cotton. It is listed as poisonous. So every part of the plant, the leaves, the stem, the flowers, the roots are all poisonous. We have to be careful with it. And it is beautiful. It is a beautiful plant. There's it's a, it's a midnight blue, and then there's one where it's blue and then the lower part of the color is white. Um, just tell you what it's used for, useful sedatives, and in a little tiny bit. Around the home, that's what alfalfa, 
questions in here for four extra credits for livestock and cattle and horses and sheep. Grows from zone four through eight. I actually think it'll grow in zone three to zone two. So it's a very tough for the plant. I got a tap root on it. Once it gets established, very, very difficult to get out. So farmland fodder plant combined with mint makes an excellent nutritional tea, which is stimulating vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. So we're going to be talking a little bit about making our fertilizer using alfalfa pellets. So I just catalog, and I'm not going to take up any more students' time, but the catalog has just got a wealth of information in it. It's just it's just enough information to get you curious about that herb or, or in-depth information. So it's not it's not what I would imagine is like why I have to buy, but it's certainly help you decide on what you want to grow and maintain. It's a fun catalog. I'm a geeky horticulturist. I think reading the catalog like this at night before I go to bed is what I do. You are now becoming geeky master gardeners. You are allowed to read a catalog before you go to bed. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Susan, as you know, I sent out that email earlier. Uh, grew up in horticulture. She's a master gardener. She was part of the whole McIntyre team when uh, that business went to this fun nursery. If you haven't been, if you had never been to it, it was a very fun nursery to go visit. And Susan now has the hot orchard downtown. Sam, which is a cool coffee shop. And books. There's a wonderful hot chocolate piece there. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn the work program over to Susan. And I'm going to be in and out a little bit. Okay. Yeah. And then we take break. We'll talk about the bee college, and then we'll jump into the irrigation class. Well, good evening, everyone. It's so great to see you. Um, as Catherine said, my name is Susan Allen. I am a former master gardener. Um, I should say I still am, but I have not done any of the things that you all will get to do with all the fun things like. Um, looking at dead trees, which I've done a lot in my lifetime. Uh, we owned McIntyre's Garden Center, which is across from King Supers. It's like a weird blank lot now. Um, I think Governor Mead had his headquarters there. It's like a weird green building. And then there's like six and a half acres. So we had annuals, perennials, trees, shrubs, uh, house plants. Uh, we ran it for close to 20 years. And then I decided to get married. And I washed my hands of horticulture and I said, I'm going to Colorado and I'm not going to garden anymore. And um, except for fun, for fun, because I was doing it for a profession for so long. Um, and my last landscaping job here in town was the hospital courtyard. So if you look at the hospital courtyard, there's a lot of poplar trees in that courtyard, strategically placed. Um, I remember two weeks before my wedding, I was in one of the planters planting some bolts in there. But um, Hawthorns, um, spiritually speaking, um, mean love and protection. And uh, they were used as a cardiotonic um, back in the day, uh, pre-medicine pre pharmacopoeia. You'll find reference to Hawthorne trees as a tonic. We still use it as a tonic, but I would not recommend um, that you go off your heart medication and start taking Hawthorne. We are very respectful of, of uh, Western medicine or allopathic medicine. Um, we cannot treat or diagnose. And um, so today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience, not only growing herbs. So when I left Cheyenne, I got married. I worked in nonprofit for a little bit, and then I started an organic produce farm. So I had an organic produce farm in Windsor, Colorado. Is anybody be familiar with Windsor at all? So if you go north on 7th, um, Windsor Lake is right here. And I was farming the two and a half acres just north of Windsor Lake. It was really fun. It was a lot of work. 
Um, I uh, wound up getting West Nile <clears throat> working uh, in that in that during that time frame, which is common in Weld County, especially. And uh, I also was living in a house and gone through the Windsor tornado back in 2014. So it was loaded with mold and just a lot of toxins and stress is not a good thing either. And um, farming is incredibly stressful getting up for those farmer markets at farmers markets at like four, you know, 4 a.m. and whatnot and making like $200. <laughs> it's not, not super fun. But anyway, um, I wound up coming home to Cheyenne um, after running the farm and uh, my dad had dementia. And so I, I came home to heal and also help with my parents. And in that journey, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I was finding out that um, I needed to make some massive lifestyle changes, massive. And that included what I was eating, what I was putting in my body, managing my stress, which is why we have meditation at the Hawthorne tree. And I still don't manage stress very well. I feel like I'm sometimes a walking hypocrite, even though I have a meditation center, but it's all there and it's all there as part of the journey. But today we're going to talk about growing herbs in Cheyenne, and I'm going to touch on a few uh, different things, some of my um, conventional wisdom and some try and, you know, follow what is uh, considered um, um, research-based information. I'm a big one on research-based information. I think it's incredibly important. Even when I owned my garden center, the last thing I wanted to do was just pull something out of my hat. And we followed the CSU information sheets. We followed, um, you know, all the things just so we were sure that we were giving out good information. So an herb, it's a very loosely um, held term. In botany, it just refers to the herba herbaceous plant. Um, as a small seed bearing plant without a woody stem. So um, it's primarily when you say herb, it refers to the aerial part of the plant. Because we, in medicinal, for medicinal purposes, we'll use roots, sometimes they'll use bark. But for tonight's conversation, we're primarily talking about herbaceous herbs. And that primarily refers to the aerial part. Maybe in the, I'm doing an advanced master gardeners, then we'll talk maybe more about you know, using tree barks and roots and berries and all those things. So, um, but it is a loosely held term. We loosely interchange spices and herbs. Uh, a lot of time you'll hear us um, interchange those two. So types of herbs, we, we look at, well, let me back up for a second. It's really important to, uh, so when I was in the horticulture world, I was really always looking for plants that would be uh, bred for color, for uh, disease resistance, all the things that we all look for now. Um, and all of you, when you look at your garden, you're looking for uh, the best, um, sorry, somebody's trying to get in here, the best plant for this area. For instance, cilantro that doesn't bolt, basil that doesn't bolt, or, you know, because that's a really common thing, and we'll talk about that. But when we talk about medicinals, I had to take off all of my cultivar hat. I mean, any of my varieties, because we truly look at this, just native uh, medicinal plants because they've been studied. So I've had to kind of shelf a lot of the, so I'm not going to talk a lot about cultivars and varieties with the exception of um, some of the things that um, Catherine has put. This is her slideshow. And then I went and kind of augmented it a little bit. So we both kind of put it together. But um, the use, different herbs are used for different things. So culinary herbs, like there may be a, a basil out there that's bred for this optimal flavor. But if I'm using it medicinally, I'm not, I'm looking at um, just optimum um, teniflorum. Um, and so I'm just looking at just the basic plant. So, and it's also used for aromatics. Um, they will uh, do a lot of distilling of herbs for um, essential oil purposes. I would like to just say here, I do not recommend ever, ever, ever ingesting essential oils. And here's why. When they um, take the plant and they pack it into, it's called um, the mark, and they have big barrels and they'll take, uh, you know, pounds and pounds and pounds of, of mark and put it into this barrel for the distillation process. 
um, it comes out pretty dang strong. And you're separating the plant from um, the constituents in the plant. So, you know, you've got the peel, you let's just take a lemon, for instance. It takes six lemons to make one drop of essential oil. And you've split apart the pith, you've split apart the fruit part, and you had, you know, and the the outside. Um, we sell essential oils at the Hawthorne Tree. I use essential oils, but incredibly sparingly, and I would never ever ingest them. Um, I've seen people show up with uh, you know, organ failure actually from it. Um, when it was in France, it was um, you know, it used to be you had to almost be a doctor in order to prescribe essential oils. So just we'll leave that there. So um you know, that's a whole other topic. We could have an entire um, program on essential oils, but I, for all intents and purposes, I would say don't, don't um, ingest them. And then, so ornamental, you know, herbs, <laughs> um, some of them don't have really showy flowers, but they may have incredible, like cool foliage, like a hosta, you know, that's a, an interesting plant to kind of tuck into a landscape. Um, and so there's a lot of herbs are used, um, not so much for the flower, but maybe for the foliage. And then uh, medicinal herbs, when we talk about medicinal, we are using them to assist the body's natural state of um, the body wants to go be into homeostasis. And so herbs help nudge the body through the constituents that are naturally occurring in the plants nudge the body back into um, uh, homeostasis. And again, um, any information in this presentation is not meant to treat, cure, or diagnose anything. So we're just kind of just right out of the gate. We're going to talk about, um, so this would be like a formal herb garden. This is, happens to be in Germany, um, very nicely kept. Um, back in my day, I loved you know, horticulture, the definition of horticulture is intensively, um, uh, what is it? It's an in, intensively, uh, I used to know the definition of this. Uh, now I can't remember. It's intensive, uh, I can't think of the word. Anyway, this is intense. <laughs> Deciding where everything goes. And who doesn't love to like, you know, part of the fun of gardening is, like planning your garden out and, you know, just the heights and the spread and all of the things. But um, later on in my years, um, after fighting weeds, I have become um, a little bit more relaxed in terms of not trying to create these perfect um, scenarios. This is a really nice uh, picture of some raised beds. Um, I've, I'll stop here and just talk a little bit. I know you guys have had a soils class. Primarily, most of the herbs that we're going to talk about tonight are um, need well-draining soil um, as well as you can create it. Um, and I know sometimes that's tough. There are some herbs that will adapt to less than perfect and are alkaline soils, um, which are around nine, isn't it? Nine, Catherine? Nine-ish. Alkaline. Alkalinity in Cheyenne, is it still around, hovering around 8.5 and 9? Yeah, yeah. I've kind of forgotten a few few things, but um, but anyway, so uh, this is how I've gardened now. What I've changed in my life from back when I was intensively cultivating, that's the word I was looking for, cultivate, um, was looking at becoming more of an observer. Um, you know, I'm so busy trying to control everything in my garden that I, I, I really have become more aware of what's out there and more curious um, because there's a lot of plants out there that, um, that are um, just spectacular right where they're at. And so I've seen some of the messiest gardens that, um, my mentor, Laura, has gardened, who was my herbalism teacher. When I first went to her house, I just wanted to get in there and start pulling weeds. But then I found out that most of what I was stepping on was actually medicinal and can be used for either food or medicine. 
Um, and so I really have become a little more lax on what happens in my garden. So we're going to start out um, just the majority of what we're going to talk about. There's a ton of Lamaceae's in here, the mint family. They, are, they represent a huge um, uh, section of, of what we would call herbs. But that's just for like herb gardens and culinary herbs. There are a lot of in the Asteraceae family and some of the other um, families that we would talk about in a more advanced class. But for this purpose, as you'll see, a lot of the, the things we're going to talk about tonight are in the mint. There's about 210 genera and 3,500 species of mints out there. Um, very aromatic, um, and most of the parts are used, the aerial parts or the herbaceous parts um, are used culinarily. Um, yeah, when it's crushed, the foliage usually has a very pleasant odor. The stems are square. So you can tell you're dealing with the mint uh, by the square stems. And the flowers are very abundant, uh, very attractive. They're two marist. Um, the calyx are two lipped. Uh, and corolla is strongly two lipped, a labiate, hence the family name. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this picture, but um, to me, it kind of looks uh, reminiscent of like almost like a snapdragon in a way. Um, so we had to take um, lots of botany, um, and I'd forgotten some of it, but I, this is a good refresher for me too. So we're going to talk about, um, let's see, this will go. So Agastache or Agastache, um, you can pronounce the two different, and this is Funiculum. So this is in the um, Lamiaceae family. Um, there's a picture of it right here, but um, let me back up here. But it was a lot of order. Typically found in prairies, dry uplands, um, forested areas, plains. It grows to two to four feet tall. Um, it blooms mid, -summer, mid to late summer and lavender to purple flowers. Um, it's a very great plant to attract bees, um, good pollinator plant, hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, and so the leaves are primarily used for making teas. It tastes a little bit like um, licorice or root beer, I say. Um, it could grow in full sun to part shade, um, does well in, in moist soils, but needs good drainage. Um, the thing I want to say here is um, most of the Lamaceae's are prone to powdery mildew somewhere along the way. We had some Agastaches or Agastaches at our store that we sold. And it was um, <clears throat> it was a monarda. Monarda tends to get um, a lot of powdery mildew in it. They were just loaded. I just kind of ignore it, but because um, it's usually towards the end of the season when it gets start getting really bad. But um, culinarily, it's um, great for like adding to cookies, um, things like that. Um, great for potpourris, um, ornamentally. It's not a super um, ornamental plant. I think it's used more for its um, culinary, um, aromatic, and medicinal uh, pur purposes. Historically, it's been used um, as a cough suppressant. There's a picture. So this is another Agastache, not to be confused with Agastache or Agastache funiculum. Um, they are uh, still in the Lamaceae family, but you can see they're really they're very different plants. I wish I could zoom in here. Um, this one you guys might be more familiar with, with its kind of gray-like foliage. When I was gardening, um, I was past president of Garden Centers of Colorado, and we were very involved with Plant Select. I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Plant Select at all, but um, I remember that Paniotti, I can never pronounce his last name, colitis. Um, they introduced the Coronado Sunset, which is a really popular um, variety of um, Agastache. This one, I think, to me, is um, really spectacular in a garden. It's um, kind of thread-like um, foliage and uh, grayish green um, <clears throat> and really uh, spectacular uh, flowers.
So um, it's hardy to zone three to 10, depending on the variety. Average water needs, it is very drought tolerant once established, but um, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it takes a while to get, um, to get established. Uh, culinary it still has that root beer like flavor. Um, and seeds can be added to cookies uh, used in potpourris, and it's also attractive to um, hummingbirds and butterflies. So anise, um, also now, no, wait a minute, this is an embolifer, so um, we are switched over. There are a few embolifers in here, the APACA family, which is the carrot family. So um, um, embolifers are, um, Oops, I think I have somebody waiting. So Annis grows uh, one to two feet tall, has a finely cut serrated leaf and a very small whitish flower in flat clusters. Um, the leaves and seeds have warm, um, sweet taste that suggests licorice. Um, it is an annual here in um, this part of the country. It grows very rapidly from seed um, and you should plant it like after the danger of frost has passed. Um, it planted in rows then to six to eight inches apart um, in rows two feet apart. The green leaves can be cut whenever plants are large enough, uh, gather seeds about one month after the flowers bloom. Um, we use ants in a lot, we use it in our chai at the Hawthorne tree. It makes a lovely addition to teas. Um, for the flavor. Um, it can also be used in salads and as a garnish. Um, it can be used to flavor cakes and cookies. Um, I love sticking embolifers into flower arrangements. They're just really kind of cool if you kind of tuck them in as an accent for that. Medicinally speaking, it's used as a carminative um, and uh, um, for upset stomachs, which a lot of um, the mints are known for. Okay, here's bee balm. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so bee balm, one of my favorites. So we're gonna talk about Monarda fistulosa. There are a lot of bee balms out there. Monarda fistulosa has this sort of lavendery colored bloom. And you'll see on the market though, there's a lot of Monardas that has, um, you know, more of a red color to them. And they're a little more showy the cultivars or the hybrids. Plants can thrive in full sun or partial shade. Um, they need to be kept evenly moist. They can be vigorous to the point of invasiveness and they are deer resistant. So if you have problems with deer where you are. Um, the flowers make an attractive, uh, tasty addition to soups. There's a lot of carbacol in there. I'm pronouncing that right. Um, so it's very um, camphorous the smell to it. And um, it's good in baked goods, jellies, and beverages. Um, the leaves can be used in dried floral arrangements. Um, very, like I said, camphorous when crushed. And medicinally, it's um, incredibly antimicrobial, antibacterial. It's used um, a lot for cold coughs and nausea. Bee balm, one of the easiest ones to grow to the point of being invasive, but oh my gosh, we at the Hawthorne Tree, I order this at 50 pounds at a time. Um, yeah, it's not, we use lemon balm a lot and for good reason. It is a wonderful plant, medicinally speaking. Um, it's also an incredibly good flavor plant um, for a lot of things. So it's in a lot of the teas that we make, our two uh, cool teas, our sunshine lemon and our hawthorne hibiscus, both have lemon balm in there for that lemony flavor. It does have a little bit of a, a just a slightly bitter aftertaste, um, eat it, but fresh. If you ever grow lemon balm in your uh, garden, boy, a fresh, just crush the leaves, put it in some water and steep it. It's, it's just lovely. Um, the reason why it's so revered as well is it, it has been touted um, as a good antiviral. So Melissa Fischnellis has been used um, a lot for as an antiviral. It's also a very good nervine. It helps calm and soothe. 
um, the nervous system. So um, it's like I said, it's pretty easy to grow. Um, I can hear grown. Oh, is there a question? Sorry. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, you've grown it. Has anybody else grown it? Yeah. So um, it is just, I think you can, I can't get enough of it. So if you have a, a, a surplus, you can come see me. Maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about the Ossimums, basils. Very huge family. This is a really interesting plant in that it can be really easy to grow, and it can also be really fussy. Has anyone here grown an Aurelia ever? Yeah, Aurelias are like that for me. They're like, you'll see people and they have these beautiful like Aurelias growing and you're like, how do you, you know, once you get them in the right spot in the right location, they just flourish. Basil can be like that. Doesn't like to be too hot and it definitely doesn't like to be too cold. Um, you can start it inside four weeks before the last frost and then um, transplant it. I have had good luck germinating in the ground as long as the soil is very well worked. You want like a good tilt, good drainage. Um, it doesn't like to be soggy. And this probably is a good time to talk maybe a little bit about watering practices for herbs. And I'm sure Catherine's probably talked about this um, and you guys are gonna look at drip irrigation. When I had my farm in Windsor, I had 3,000 linear feet of drip irrigation. And my the whole farm was on drip because it just is really hard to, well, first of all, it's hard to overwater, I mean, overhead water and not have that water loss. And a lot of these plants don't like to have um, soggy leaves because they are prone to powdery mildew, especially the Lamiaceae. So it is better to um, water, uh, you know, uh, at the um, root zone. So uh, basils are best kept around 70 degrees. Um, it was probably one of the biggest plants in my career that I've thrown out from getting too waterlogged or thrown out from getting too cold or thrown out from getting too hot or thrown out for bolting. So um, I grew basil commercially in Windsor we had a restaurant there called the Hard. I don't know if you guys have ever eaten there. It's on Windsor on Main Street. But we would grow basil and they, the chefs would come over and get basil for the pizza. So it was kind of fun. Uh, we always loved it when they came over because they'd always take what we were growing and turn it into really cool food like beet ice cream. Highly recommended. It is phenomenal. Um, so culinarily, you guys are probably very familiar with the uses of basil in pasta sauces and things like that. Credible in salads, frayed in dishes, um, very highly used in um, essential oil blending. Medicinally speaking, it's good for gastrointestinal issues and um, respiratory conditions. And we are just touching the surface on any of the medicinal stuff because that could be a whole nother course years long. So calendula, also one of my absolute favorites. I also grew uh, calendula for, um, I don't think it makes a very good cup. I grew cup flowers when I had the farm, but I don't think it makes a really great cup flower because it's so short, uh, but it's a beautiful border and they're just so fun um, to see. Uh, they don't have much of a flavor, um, but the benefits of, of um, calendula, also known as pot marigolds, um, they're great for, um, as pest control. So they're a great companion plant to stick in and around some of your other um, plants if you're doing a more integrated um, type of garden. Um, it's, it'll do well in sun or light shade. Um, it doesn't like to be super hot, likes to be well-drained. Um, and the flowers and the foliage are edible. Like I said, it doesn't have a super great flavor, but it's great like as a salad um, kind of ornament on a plate. Um, and the blooms, like I said, make a really nice for, um, garden border. 
we use a lot of um, calendula in, at my store as well because it, it's so it's an Asteraceae and Asteraceae's contain inulin and inulin is known as a prebiotic so it helps with digestion it's also used in the cosmetic industry for smoothing and soothing and there has been there have been some studies on using um, calendula for the digestive system to help um, soothe and heal that epithelial tissue so catnip also one of my favorite, not to be confused with cat mint. So this is Nepeta cataria um, and different from uh, Nepeta, mus I can never, Musanini or something. I can't ever remember the full Latin for um, cat mint. Cat mint has been bred for the flower, not for the medicinal purpose. It smells like catnip. Your cats may go crazy for it but it shouldn't really be, ever be used um, in a medicinal setting, if that makes sense. I have people say, oh, I have tons of catnip for you and they'll bring it in and it's catnip. And I'm like, oh, I can't use it. So, um, you know, it ha just hasn't been studied. These are the plants um, primarily when we talk about the medicinal um, you know, purposes, they have been studied for their constituents. Um, so just a, a, a story about catnip. So my dad uh, just passed away with, from dementia in uh, August, and catnip is known to be a class four cooling herb. When we talk about herbalism, we'll talk about energetics, you know, hot, dry, drying, cooling, moistening, that kind of thing. And catnip is, has, is an incredible sedative. Um, it'll take a person's temperament down, but you have to be careful with it, if, especially if they're on any pharmaceutical drugs that can interact with that. It can make it even more um, sedative. But when my dad would get real agitated, I would brew some catnip and within five to 10 minutes, his, his demeanor would settle down. So it really was amazing. Uh, we use it in our sleep tea as well, because it is um, has kind of some sedative properties. Um, cats love it. It does the opposite. They freak out and um, it's like a, you you know they'll roll in it but only 70 percent of all cats actually have that um genetic makeup that makes them attracted to catnip so not all cat all cats um love catnip um so it's fairly easy to grow not highly ornamental the catnip is not super exciting um i would say i would grow it more for um insect repellent um and or for your cat or for medicinal purposes but it's really not super showy um it's just the foliage is just kind of there caraway so i have never yes um the the um i would distill it so i would do like an essential oil almost would be the best way to do that Um, yeah, well, catnip's not very showy. I mean, it's really not, and cat mint is, I mean, it's going to have those, they breed it for the bright purple flowers. It's very showy and cat nip is just more kind of a purplish white, whitish flower. And, um, it's a lot taller. It's a lot taller plant than cat mint. But I love cat mint. And it does. It smells good. You know, I guess if somebody really wanted to sit down and study one of the cultivars, it might have some of the same properties, but I just don't know. So, and I'm, I'm not willing to take that gamble. So, because when they're messing with a plant, how do we know what they took out or what they're, you know, um, what they bred out of the plant as well? So, caraway, um, it's a biennial. Um, you might be familiar with caraway because they use it a lot in dry bread. Um, but again, I have never um, grown. Have you seen any grown caraway here? You have? Any words of wisdom on that one? Enjoy it. 
So, um, caraway seeds, um, again, they use it a lot in cooking, um, very aromatic. Um, again, the bright white flowers of any of the umbellifers, uh, I find kind of a nice accent in the garden and also in the floral arranging. Mm -hmm. um, they also use caraway seeds um, in liqueurs. Um, it, uh, medicinally speaking, again, um, used for the digestive system. So chamomile. So this is um, Roman chamomile, um, not to be confused with German chamomile. So there's two different kinds of chamomile. German chamomile is the one that we primarily use in the tea industry. It is the sweeter, um, more commonly found in teas. Um, they are the growing points of them are about the same. I don't think there's a, a big, huge difference. Um, I will say this, there's tons of wild chamomile in Lions Park. And there is more medicine in Lions Park than you could possibly imagine. In fact, last year, Laura came up and we did a walk, but if you, um, it's loaded with plantain, which is also a skin softener. Plantain is great for uh, using in like salves and balms and things like that. But if you go walk around the lake and uh, in the grass, there's chamomile everywhere. So it's, it's very easily grown. Um, it can be somewhat invasive once established. And, you know, it's pretty short. It's more of a good like border type um, flower. Um, you, lovely in salads. Oh my gosh, the tea is lovely. It's like drinking honey on a warm morning or a warm afternoon. Just that that smell is intoxicating and it's um, great for calming the nerves. It's a great nervine, great to calm, calm people down. Um, you can also use it um, as a mouthwash for sores or toothaches. If you have a kiddo that's a little fussy because of a toothache, you can soak like a washcloth at half strength and let them suck on it and it help it can help. Chives. Anybody here grow chives? <coughs> so chives for me are always like they're there and then they're done and I didn't get to use them and then they're all tough and weird. Um because they come too early. I, I mean it's like you know if you had chives at the same time you were digging potatoes it would be wonderful but no such luck. It always comes super early, but they're really fun to see like in the early spring and you can dry them if you want. Um, but I mean, chives are very useful and oh my gosh, all kinds of things, salad dressings, you know, baked potatoes, uh, salads, uh, you can use chives for a myriad of things. So it is an allium, which is in the onion family, um, or garlic family. And, um, so it's also related to the amaryllis. So it's in the amaryllidaceae family. So kind of interesting. I always find um, kind of fun um, facts about plants when I start looking at their families. Um, did anybody grow amaryllis during Christmas? Yeah, they're so fun, especially at this time when it's dark. And um, so they are a very hardy perennial bunching. Um, they grow in bunches. Um, they demand very little care. Um, they can be a little bit invasive. Um, they, uh, the purple globe-like flowers, the alliums, make a great for flower arranging. You can stick those in as a side thing. And um, medicinally speaking, um, they contain choline and folate um, in chives, which is um, has been researched for. Uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and also um, the nervous system. So, okay, cilantro and coriander. Now, I grew this commercially in Windsor, and my experience with that was I had um, cilantro for days um, the next year and the next year. It's the plant that keeps on giving. Um, it does bolt pretty quickly. So, um, but you might want to find a lot of uses for coriander, which is the seed. So cilantro is the her 
herbaceous plant part, and coriander is the spice that comes afterwards from the seed that we can use in cooking. Also in the Apiaceae family are Nymphelifer. Um, it's an annual plant, um, but it does freely reseed. Um, easily grown from seed in the garden, um, thin plants seven to 10 inches apart. Uh, it's not super fussy about soil. Um, harvest plants when they're four inches thick, pick leaves sparingly, gather seeds as they ripen in midsummer. Culinarily speaking, um, the seeds are used um, oh, for an, a, a number of things. Um, they should probably be ground. Um, they have a food perfume taste and odor that are used in the condiment and confec confections. And the leaves are used in Mexican dishes, summer soups, or salads. Um, again, those umbellifers make a nice flower arrangement. And medicinally speaking, they have been used in digestive issues. There's a lot of things I'm skipping over medicinally. So again, if you guys ever want to go back and talk more in depth about it. So dill. APACA, uh, bluish green stems that contrast with finely divided yellow green plume like leaves and yellowish flowers. Dill grows about two to three feet high. Um, it's an annual. It can also freely reseed in your garden, easily grown from seed. Um, so it's not something you need to start inside. Um, sow the seeds where you want to grow it, and um, it's very difficult to transplant. Best result. Um, pick leaves just as the flowers open. Pick seeds when they are flat and brown. Great in salads, salad dressings, pickling, um, great accent to bouquets, um, acts as a carminative and good for digestion. Fennel. That was the fun one. I grew that um, on my farm and it was kind of a fun. So, what I would say about herbs too is. Um, you know, we can give you all the wisdom in the world, but just have fun. If something strikes your fancy, it's, I mean, it's a packet of seeds for crying out loud, you know, um, live dangerously because you never know, like you never know what you might get. And, um, you know, I grew okra, I, you know, I grew all these crazy things, um, just to see what would happen. And I had some pleasant surprises, actually, fennel being one of them. Um, I mean, it's, it's a great plant, roasted fennel oof, with some vegetables, a little olive oil, um, is, you know, it's the best, that very sweet flavor. Um, it's a perennial, but it usually grows as an annual. Uh, the leaves are really quite spectacular. Um, that fern like, um, leaf, um, fennel seeds are used as a condiment, great in pizza uh, pizza dough if you like fennel. Some people do not like fennel. Fennel is widely used for, I know we're talking a lot about the digestive system. It's also a galactagogue, so um, sometimes um, it's used for nursing mothers to help their milk come in. Um, so not everybody loves the taste of fennel, but um, I, I rather like it. Um, it kind of has a mapley syrup flavor to me. Um, um, so well, more, and that's fenugreek, sorry. It's more of an anise-like flavor to it. Yeah, I'm thinking of fenugreek. But um, fennel is, oops, I need to go too far there. Um, any questions so far on anything? Um, I don't. I just put it in my uh, crust. It really adds an interesting uh, flavor to the pizza. So, pots, all right, cumulus. Um, so this is in the Cannabinaceae family. So um, not to be confused with marijuana or hemp, but it is in the Cannabinaceae family and it does have some um, incredibly sedative type effects. We also use this in our sleep tea because it does kind of calm you down. Um, but it's primarily used, um, it's a dioecious, meaning it has male and female um, parts in the plant, uh, rhizomatous, 
um, twining perennial vine that has um, is grown commercially for harvest of female fruits, which are used by, well, wait a minute, not the same plant. I'm sorry, one male, one female. Sorry, I got that mixed up. Um, and so the female plants, the strobles on the female plants are now being, a lot of the flowers are being bred for those strobles. Have you guys seen some of the um, like perennial or um, annual uh, flowers? They, they just have these really cool long strobles on them that are like purple and iridescent and they make a great like pot um, plant. So they're really kind of osmosis and like pot. Um, so um, hops were primarily used um, as a preservative. Um, it can help prevent gram negative bacteria from growing in the beer or wort. Um, the female strobles, as I said, are gorgeous. So I'm gonna back up and just, these aren't super exciting. Just regular old hops is not super exciting. Um, it's not super um, interesting uh, per se, but some of the cultivars and hybrids are really quite fascinating. And as I said, medicinally, it's a good sedative and uh, for the nervous system, excuse me. So this is hyssop, um, hyssopus, yes.
So this is um, Hisop, um, just or Hisopus officinalis, also in the Lamiaceae family. You guys kind of gotten um, the idea that there's a lot of mints. Um, hyssop is a very hardy perennial, not to be confused with anise hyssop, which is Agastache or Agastache. So completely different plant. Um, but hyssop is a very hardy perennial that grows about two feet tall. It has woody stems, small pointed leaves, and spikes of purple flowers. Um, there are forms with pink or white flowers. If kept clipped, it makes a good border or small hedge. Hardy to zone um, four. Hyssop is, will grow in rather poor soils, easily propagated from seed when it is established, and it's quite a quite hardy plant. Um, Harvesting, use the youngest leaves and stems as needed. Culinarily um, speaking, hyssop's pungent leaves are um, used to flavor liqueurs and sometimes um, as a condiment. Um, the oil from the leaves are used to make perfume. And medicinally, it is used um, for coughs, colds, and congestion. Lavender, who doesn't love lavender? Well, not everybody. I have a lot of people that are allergic to it or, yeah, not, not a big love, yeah. Um, but if you do love it, man, is it intoxicating. It's just, you know, one of those things that just, it's so calming, soothing. We use it in teas. We use it in essential oils. We use it um, um, in a lot of salves. It's great for wound um, uh, healing. So we will use... Um, um, some lavender and lavender extraction for, um, I make a salve, it's called the balm, and it has lavender in there for, um, for its healing properties. Um, again, if you use the essential oil, which you can, but use it sparingly with a carrier oil if you're going to put it on a wound, um, you don't want to just slap it on there. Um, so lavender is one of those plants, kind of like basil, where it can be really easy to grow, but it's incredibly temperamental plant. Um, I grew it in Windsor. I actually stratified the seed because it is one of those seeds that needs to be cooled down or, um, you know, seeded prior to so the seed can crack open. So I just threw some soil in a, um, in a non-draining um, uh, tray and put the lid on and stuck it in the refrigerator for about three weeks to a month and then pulled it out and I, I got them to germinate. I had about 50% rate, so it is doable, um, but I would suggest primarily getting your lavender from um, you know, a cutting or a propagation. So um, it grows. It doesn't like to be super wet, but it also doesn't like to dry out. And unfortunately, like rosemary, lavender and rosemary are one of those plants where you don't know if it's over or under until it's too late. It'll go from alive to dead. And um, so I recommend um, being very um, diligent until you know what your plants like, um, feeling the soil, finding out, you know, it's always, I just do the old stick the finger in and see what the root zone's doing. Um, you can stick a probe in, um, you know, it does like, um, uh, you know, it can grow in uh, rocky, um, poor soils. It doesn't, you know, it's not bothered by our alkalinity as much as it is um, our winters um, and just overwatering or underwatering it. Um, we use uh, lavender for cut flowers, creates an interesting twist on cooking can be added to Herbs de Provence for a really nice twist. I think it's lovely in potatoes with like combining it with like some sages and an other um, potpourri of herbs. It's really lovely. Um, lavender is one of the most famous or um, of fragrance of all time. Um, it is distilled and also used in sachets and perfumes. Um, ornamentally, it makes a nice border plant. Medicinally, it's very calming, soothing. We use it for root care due to its antimicrobial, antibacterial. Also, sometimes used um, coupled with um, peppermint for nausea. If you take a little bit of peppermint essential oil and a little bit of lavender oil and rub it on your hands and just 
kind of breathe it in and it helps with um, calming it also with headaches and nausea. So we'll talk a little bit about Lavendula angustifolia and Lavendula, I cannot pronounce that, sto Stoachis, Stachys, Stachys, Stachys. Um, so that's the French lavender. So I'm going to back up this slide here because this really shows the difference. This slide here on the left is um, lavender and gustifolia. That is um, the true um, uh, English lavender. And the one on the right is, uh, oops, um, the one on the right is more bulbous, um, not quite as hardy. And so that is the, um, the French lavenders. So the two most commonly grown lavenders are Hidcoat and Munstead. Um, and the French group would be some of these other ones, which I have not, I have never grown um, French lavender. I've only grown English lavender. But the lavender that I transplanted in Windsor on the farm into my garden, I actually uprooted when I moved back home to Cheyenne and I put it in, I live in the avenue, so I put it out there, but I think we overwatered it and it died. So, but it did live for a couple of seasons. So, all right, so let's talk about mints. Um, so um, in the Lamiaceae family, obviously, but I wanna talk about the two different, um, this one is another one that needs to kind of be clarified. It's super, super hard to find peppermint. Spearmint is readily available, that is the um, mintha spicata, um, but mintha ex piperita um, is, is finding that peppermint is really tough. Um, so a lot of times people will come in and say, I have some mint, but it's primarily spearmint. I find that spearmint and peppermint, um, they're very useful in teas. We use it obviously in a lot of our teas, um, depending on whatever it is that we're making, but both of them, um, think of pepper mint and spear mint. They don't, they're great for lower digestion, but they're horrible for people with acid reflux because you think of icy hot. So like peppermint goes down really super cooling and you're like, oh, this feels great. And then all of a sudden, if you ever have suffered from any kind of upper digestive things, um, it will, it will kind of rebound on you. And, um, I used to drink um, Celestial Teas and did not to knock it because it's a wonderful tea, but I dared, I started, I was drinking their sleepy time tea because I wanted to go to sleep and I drink it and I'd be like, oh, I feel so good, ready to fall asleep. And then all of a sudden I had this reverse reaction and I was like wide awake. And I think it was because my upper digestive tract was not super happy. And so in our tea at the Hawthorne Tree for our sleep tea, I put in cat nip because it's also in the mint family, but it's not as strong, doesn't have quite as much of a um, react, or for me anyway, a reaction to my um, very poor upper, upper um, GI tract. Um, but just beware that it's really hard to find true peppermint. Um, and so, um, but they are, it is doable and you can find it. But um, spearmint, you can grow from seeds, although it's better from cuttings. And peppermint, you almost always, because this, the seeds don't go true to form. It's a cultivar or a hybrid. So any questions on peppermint? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like little well, strawberries can do the same thing. They just kind of get... I don't know, worn out, <laughs> you know, it's just, um, the roots are really, I mean, peppermint and, and um, spearmint are incredibly invasive too. And even just getting them out and redoing your soil, I think that's also part of it too, because it's just, it's like a big mat in there. Um, and, you know, peppermint can be incredibly invasive. Um, you know, there are some people out there that say that peppermint will repel mice, having lived on a farm. Um, I find that that is not true. Um, my cat, Sterling, bless his heart, he's like 20 years old, but he would go and drag mice into my bed at night. And I think there was, two, yeah, he, 
but the godfather you just like go in and like drop a mouse at my head so yeah it was um yeah mice if you have a mice a mouse problem it is like almost like crazy making um and you'll do anything to get rid of them and i tried it all um and sterling did get most of them but the <laughs> one time he got one played with it and then dropped it down the um the cold air return because I lived in a 101 year old farmhouse. So um, it got to smelling really nice. So, all right. So, marjoram, um, more, more Arana hortensis. Um, it's also simultaneously um, interchanged with organum marjorana. Um, and so, also in the Lamiaceae family, very fragrant annual. Um, I think marjoram is one of the most underused spices that we have out there. It's really quite lovely. It has a more complex flavor than um, oregano, and it's not quite as strong, but it's really lovely in soups. And, um, you know, so we try at the Hawthorne Tree, our goal is to make food with uh, utilizing all the spices that we have on our wall. And um, sometimes, you know, it's easy to introduce a new spice and sometimes it's just we use the mainstays of you know thyme and and all of that but marjoram in a soup is it's really good i recommend trying it um so the leaves can be used anytime um grown easily from seed or cuttings it is though considered an annual um leaves uh fresh or dried can be used in flavoring and cooking um great in dressings and vinegars and soups as i mentioned Popular essential oil. Actually, marjoram makes a really lovely um, essential oil. Um, and it's a nice as a border plant due to its um, interesting leaf color because um, it's got that gray, gray green kind of like um, the sages, which we're going to talk about here in a second. It's a great nervine um, and also sometimes used for um, colds and cough. So, Greek um, oregano. Organum vulgare hurtum is the true Greek, um, not to be confused with um, organum vulgare, which is um, it's the um, oh, not Mexican oregano. It's um, it's like fake oregano. <laughs> what is it? Um, um, do I have it here? It in my notes here. Why, yes, wild marjoram. Thank you. Oh, is it in there? Sorry, I must have put it in there. Yeah, wild marjoram. Wild marjoram is very invasive, gets pink flowers, um, and not really uh, great for um, using in cooking or ornamentally or medicinally. Um, so, oregano obviously is um, very useful. Um, again, there was a lot of oregano is very powerful. It's an incredibly powerful plant, um, medicinally, culinarily. And again, people were taking, if you take straight drops of a scent of oregano essential oil, you will burn your throat. And so it's best to uh, reserve eating oregano, I feel, um, or distilling it, at, you know, or you know, using it in a carrier oil, but never just straight. You will try your um, throat. I've done it. Or, you know, like, try it. We'll just see what happens. Um, but it's very antibacterial, um, antiviral, great for cough, cold, sinuses. It's great for a steam distillation. You can do that if you, I would say, not even using the essential oil. You can get just straight oregano and just pile on, like, all the pizza sauces. So, like, um, basil and oregano and just dump leaves in the in a really hot steamy and then just put a towel over it's really lovely to like breathe it all in um, but you're not breathing in like that pure essential oil which is it can be very caustic parsley um i have grown flat leaf i have never had good luck with um pearl leaf parsley has anybody here grown um you have good luck okay Good to know. So in the carrot family, it's an Apiaceae or the, in the umbrella fir. Um, it's a hardy biannual, but usually treated as an annual. Um, 
the hardy to zone four through nine. Uh, cut parsley when the leaves are of suitable size. Leaves can be used dried or fresh. Um, parsley is one of the most familiar of all herbs and is used for both garnishing and flavoring. Uh, makes a nice filler for bouquets. Um, medicinally, it's relatively high in vitamins A and C and iron. Uh, due to its high chlorophyll, it can help increase oxygen and sometimes used for clearing kidney stones. Uh, Rosmarinus officinalis, rosemary, um, similar to a lavender, in my opinion, it has kind of similar growth habits. It can be, um, although it doesn't really grow great in rocky conditions, um, it does need, you know, it does need drainage, but it is one that is pretty impossible to grow from seed. Um, you almost always want to start with it, and it, I've never gotten it to overwinter. Has anybody here had rosemary overwinter? Awesome. Do you live in town, or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I've never been as successful as at overwintering rosemary. So kind of those one and done or grow indoors in a very high light situation. I saw a picture of one that was just absolutely stunningly beautiful. A customer posted it and uh, it was one that I think she had gotten from us. Um, last summer, and then she wintered it over, and it was just, it was really beautiful. Um, it's very aromatic, um, used in uh, flavoring meats and dressings or as a garnish. Um, also used in soaps and lotions. The, the rosemary seed extract is also used as a preservative. Uh, we use it as a preservative in our cosmetics that we make at the Hawthorne Tree, so they don't have, um, um, we aren't using chemical um, preservatives. Um, and also we have a, a tea called the brain teaser. So uh, rosemary is good for peripheral um, circulation. Um, the Greeks wore it as a laurel or um, scholars would wear it. It's also said to, um, you know, when ingested, it can help with um, increasing memory. That is left to be debatable, but it is uh, a dilator, so um, it's um, very antiseptic, and it can also help repel um, insects. So um, this was these were Catherine's notes here with the pine rosemary. Um, that's the one that looks like a Christmas tree, and her I think her notes were not suited for culinary use. Uh, upright growing, so ARP. I've grown that one. Um, these are some other varieties that. Um, Catherine had recommended for upright growing, and then there's also the trailing variety. So, um, sage, so salvia officinalis. So here's where I want to chat a little bit about sage, is not sage, is not sage. So um, the sage that we have growing out on our prairies is actually an artemisia, and that is an um, asteraceae. So, you guys learned about probably about Asteraceae. That's the sunflower family, right? Um, and so Salvia officinalis is really the well, it's culinary sage. It's also the plant that's used um, in Native American um, smudging ceremonies. So people get confused and think that it's the sage that brush that we see growing. Um, sage brush is um, also has some medicinal qualities. There are some Native tribes that do use it. There's um, Artemisia ludovigiana, which is the male version of our sage brush. brush. And there's uh, Artemisia frigida, which is the female um, sage brush that we have. They can be used in smudging ceremonies, but oh my gosh, they're super bitter. Um, you know, if you want to get rid of some parasitic worms or anything, just have a little a few bites of that and you'll be good to go. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but anyway, so salvia officinalis, this is the culinary sage, also the sage that they used um, for um, smudging ceremonies. Um, I love it for obviously the flavor um, and it's great uh, as a garden interest. I really tend to like those gray plants. They tend to pop, they're also good accents. Um, so 
I have not had great luck wintering over sage. Um, I've been able to grow it uh, maybe for one or two years, but I've never had it like continually grow. Has anybody here grown sage? Yeah, you've got this winter over. Um, yeah, that's an artemisia. Um, it's not, it's not in the mint family. So it's not a salvia. So that wouldn't be used for culinary, but yeah, those grow great here, but they're not, um, yeah, it's not the same plant. So in here, some, uh, different, uh, Sages that Catherine's recommended: garden sages, um, autumn sages, um, other sages, and then just a note about the wild sagebrush, which is not a true um, sage. All right, stevia. Uh, we use a lot of stevia. Um, who here has used stevia for sweetening? Yeah, um, the drops. I feel like they're kind of weird. The plant leaf is really lovely in tea. So we use it in a couple of our, our um, tea blends at the Hawthorne tree. Um, stevia is not, um, it's grown more as an annual here. It's zone 10 to 11. So it's in the Asteraceae family, it reaches about two feet tall, a well-drawn soil and full sun exposure. Plants typically grow with weak and floppy stems, 12 to 24 inches tall. Plants have little ornamental attraction. The attraction here is the sweet tasting leaves, which contain glu uh, glucoside compounds that are two to 300 times sweeter by weight than cane sugar, but with no calories. Summer savory. Um, also in the Lamaceae family, tender annual that grows up to 18 inches tall. It has small bronze, green leaves and a very small white or lavender flowers. The leaves are pungent and spicy. Um, it is grown as an annual here. Grows best in uh, well-worked loamy soil. Seeds can be planted in the garden in the spring. Um, harvesting cut leafy tops when the plants are in bud, hang in an airy shaded place until crisp and dry. Uh, used for meats and vegetables, generally sweeter than winter savory, but adds um, tang to food. Uh, tarragon. Tarragon's fun to grow, not super exciting on the ornamental side. Um, it is in the Asteraceae family. It's lovely with um, carrots and butter. <laughs> so it has just a really great flavor. I was in, I used to live in Steamboat and I had a date and my date, like the date didn't last. I mean, it's like a one and done, but I will never forget those carrots. So it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I make them when I want to impress people I will do like a you know butter and carrot kind of thing with tarragon in it it's really lovely um so it's really easy to grow I've had my mom lives we live on um three blocks north of the capital and we've had a stand of of um fennel or tarragon that has been there for years and it's really fun that you clip it off great and like vinegars and dressings, um, all the things, and um, super easy to grow. Um, so medicinally, um, it's been known to help with circulation to the digestive tract and for inflammation. Um, I have used it in... Um, Fire cider. Have you guys ever made fire cider? Yeah, we should have a fire cider class. I think that would be really fun because it's really easy to do, and you just basically shove everything into like some apple cider vinegar and let it ferment garlic and um, 
you know, radishes or horseradish is better. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's really fun, but yeah, it's good. I, but I know I haven't yet. Yeah. Yeah, it is, but it's super good. It is. Yes. It's a perennial. Yep. And so now thyme. Thyme is also an incredibly youthful, um, flower herb. Um, it's, uh, Low growing, sprawling. There's a lot of varieties that are not super exciting, but some of the cultivars and varieties are great for like garden paths in between flagstone. Um, and it's um, very useful for seasoning. Um, I put thyme in everything. I think thyme is like my, my go to spice for so many things. I am convinced that when I get sick, and I make chicken noodle soup that it's not the chicken, it's the thyme, the tons of thyme that I put in there that helps. The thyme is, it's a wonderful medicinal. It helps boost the immune system, um, can, you know, soothe inflamed mucous membranes, um, very antimicrobial, antibacterial. Um, and I, but it's very dry. You can, if you get too much thyme, it's, it can really dry the system out. So one thing to be, um, but it's yeah used in gumbos, uh, bullabays, clam chowder, poultry stuffing, slow cook dishes. Um, great in this you know essential oil. Um, great diffused in the air. Um, but yeah, time. I can't say enough about time. But man, I would hate to be harvesting time commercially. You know, as like a, <laughs> for a spice or whatever. So these are the different types of time. We have the culinary group. Um, the ground cover. Hey, sweetie, I will mail you a copy of this. I feel bad you have to take pictures, but if you want, I can, if any of you guys want a copy of this, if you can just like ask Catherine and I can send it to her and um, she can send it out to you guys. Cause it's a lot of information. It really is. Um, this is hard to um, digest. Um, but anyway, yeah. So the culinary group of time, the ground cover group, and then the citrus group, which I have never grown any of these lemon thyme. I guess I have grown lemon thyme. Um, sweet woodruff. That's also one of my favorite things. And I love sweet woodruff for a number of reasons. Primarily, it's a great ground cover um, underneath um, spruce trees where um, it needs water, it needs supplemental watering because spruce trees that are really big, you know, they've just kind of eaten up all the, um, there's nothing, like you can just put mulch down basically. But um, I've grown sweet woodruff under, um, successfully under spruce trees and it, it doesn't take off as much, but it, you can get nice, healthy stands of clumps and it just adds some interest underneath. Um, it'll handle, you know, all the pine needles and, and everything. But um, sweet rhodos is just such a sweet flower. Um, and it's in the rubaceae family. So it's a matter, which is kind of odd. Um, a low spreading perennial that forms clumps about eight inches tall. Slender leaves are born in starry whorls. The flowers are tiny, white, and form in loose clusters. When the plant is crushed, it has a sweet scent similar to freshly mowed hay and vanilla. Um, hardy to zone four through eight. Sweet rhodos can be grown as a perennial, but it needs winter protection. Um, it will thrive in semi shade and makes an attractive ground cover under taller plants. So it makes a good understory plant. Uh, culinarily speaking, sweet rhodos is often used in flavoring um, German May wine and other drinks. Um, it also is used to make perfume. Ornamentally, it's a nice ground cover, which you've talked about. And medicinally speaking, it can help clear out toxins in the body. So that is the end of my presentation. Any questions at all? Did I bore you guys with tears? Uh, yes. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. So this weekend on Sunday, Laura Cassardi, who is my herbalism teacher, uh, Laura is fascinating, knows her stuff, she is an um, incredible botanist, um, and she is doing a class on beginning herbalism at the Hawthorne Tree um, from 11 to 30, I think, or 1 p.m., 11 to 1, I think, 
on Sunday, that's the 26th. She's doing a class on aromatherapy from 2 to um, 4 on Sunday. And then Amy Kush, who is on, if you guys have gotten this, Amy is um, grows medicinal herbs for a living. She was the head grower for the growing project in Fort Collins, if you guys are all familiar with that. Um, very well, I mean, just incredible. She's going to go over to, I think, the University of Wyoming. Um, she's been very involved in agriculture throughout, um, well, certainly northern Colorado. And Amy Koosh will be speaking um, at the Gar at the Hawthorn Tree um, on March 5th. You can go to our website. It's just www.hawthorntree.com. No E on the end of Hawthorn, and you can get more information on those classes. Hawthorn trees don't have E's. It's just that darn author, Nathaniel Hawthorn, that everyone spells it with a Q. Yes. I think it was culinary um, ground cover. Oh. Yeah. So, um, oh, I do want to mention, if you notice, I skipped over Borage for a good reason. Borage was in this presentation, but I took it out. The Borage and ACA family um, has what's known as pyrolizidine alkaloids, which can sit in your liver and elevate your liver enzymes. Comfrey is in there. We still sell comfrey. It's a, it's a lovely salve. Um, but it's not um, great, I mean, so they say, I mean, some of the studies that were done, like people would drink barrage, and, um, barrage tea for like, you know, 40 years, and then they say that it ruins their liver, but I'm not one to like, you know, buck conventional wisdom, but um, but borage, um, the plant, it's just in the forget-me-not family, but it's really lovely, you know, has these um, bell-shaped flowers. Um, but I grew borage on my farm, and it tastes like fish. Like, it's really weird. It's like, it would be like if you were, like, just grab the plant out of a fish tank. That's, like, the only way I can describe it. So it's not super, um, I didn't find it super uh, beneficial for growing as an herb. I mean, it's, you don't eat a lot of blue food. We don't really tend to eat things that are blue um, in our diet. Um, but so yeah, that was one. And then um, bay leaf, because bay leaf is a um, myrtle and will not grow in Wyoming. So I've skipped over bay leaves and um, the garage and ACAs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they take the plant and put it in the mark, um, in a big barrel, and it, you know, they put it through their, their system. It's really interesting. I don't, I can't, we went in our herbalism class to Utah and learned how essential oils were made. And we were distilling pine and uh, ponderosa pine and juniper, and we, we had to collect a ton of material to get, you know, but that's, you know, it's, it's in this through the copper tubing and then it's separated out the oils and then the, um, oh, what's it called? The water, uh, floral water. Um, yes, thank you. Hydrosol, the hydrosol. So it separates out the oil and the hydrosol. And the hydrosols are very, uh, you know, great for using for different things. Does that answer your question? I think there's some companies out there that really like to sell essential oils, honestly. Um, and I think they are beneficial. We sell them. We have a class on them. I think, again, very, very, very small quantities in a carrier oil, no more than 3% if you're going to put it on your skin. Um, your skin your is the largest organ in your body and um, or of your body. And, you know, it's just 
people are overusing them. They use them for everything. And then they have them in pills and then they have them in, and we're seeing all kinds of um, harmful things. And so I just, I would use caution. Sure. Now I've always had my arm on the iPad and I just that. Yeah. Yep. I um one of my we have three herbalists at the Hawthorne Tree of Rebecca and myself went to Laura's school and we by no means I mean I am humbled every day by plants. I mean we we are not the know it alls. Um we will research things but you know if we don't feel comfortable working with somebody on a medicinal formula we will you know and we always push back to their doctor when they come in and say i'm having you know heart problems i tell them kindly that they might need to go back to their heart doctor but you know if they won't you know if they won't you know well we've made some teas that have helped people and they, we have seen great results but one of my fellow herbalists rebecca was a massage therapist and if any of you are familiar with thieves um, you know, it's a great one. And I honestly have taken a really small, like just a little bit. because it, It's pretty powerful. It took the porcelain off her sink in her massage room. So just use with caution. I make, I make enemies every day at the store when I'm like, oh, don't be, but you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. But the point out too much. This has been really lovely. I wish you guys all the best. I'm jealous. I loved my master garden training was so many years ago, but soils were fun. Have you guys done soils yet? Wow. Soils are like where it all comes together, I think. Yeah. Let's take a 12, 15 minute break. So let's take a break. There's all sorts of treats over there. There's cookies. For those of you who can eat cookies, please help yourself. And someone needs to take them home at the end of the class program tonight. So, yeah. And so let's talk about, it's going to snow. So therefore, that must be Wednesday. <laughs> Speaker, the, the guest lecture for Wednesday. And so Wednesday's class will be on Zoom because I'm just going to, I, I've already checked the weather and 
road reports and it's I eighty is already closed down. Is it snowing? No. <laughs> they saw a snowflake and they closed the interstate again. I think my husband would kill me because there's 21 sheep and a whole bunch of cattle that he does not take care of. <laughs> yeah, as much as I would love to. Um, I don't go on vacation. When you have cattle and sheep and
been what five years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to. I would just like to get back in the room. I would I meant to be Do really? Oh my gosh, I wish um, Blue Raven just gave us some. Um, yeah, what do you do? Do you work in a distillery? No, okay, for fun. Yeah, you know, you could always do, because I've worked with a lot of people, like if somebody, we could say, oh, we have a local somebody growing hops, we could kind of be a, thoroughfare for you, you know, I've thought a lot. I need to talk about pop story. So this guy can like you fry a little bit of pencil. You like fry a little bit of butter and put um pots in there and then um and then roll your corn in there and they yeah it's not hot for me. So where's the hot corn tree? We are two doors down, two doors down, uh, right across the street from um we can tell two doors down Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. It's great.
Yeah. 
That's the gardener group. And one of our big annual events, a countywide event, actually it goes over into Nebraska and down to Colorado is where we find that people come from. But it's our annual plant sale. And the master gardeners are very well known for that plant sale. We hold it out at Archer. It's in the M&K buildings, which is that first building that you come up to at the fairgrounds. I have Christina and Steve, and I have Deb over here, and they are part of the plant sale, and they're going to talk to you about what it takes. Mm -hmm. And they're also going to twist your arm to be a volunteer at the plant sale because it takes a lot of work to pull this off. You will learn a lot, you'll have a lot of fun, and you'll be really tired at the end of the day. <laughs> May 6th. Is that right? May 6th. It's really divided up into a whole series of areas. So there's going to be, if you really love growing tomatoes, there's going to be a tomato sale area and a pepper sale area. There's going to be annuals, perennials. 
plants, houseplants and some houseplants. We, we're not real big on houseplants, but we do have them once in a while. And we have, um, well, Kim Parker, who you know, she is, her and, and uh, John and Susie Heller are my go-to people for houseplants. But we typically don't have a lot of them. But we do need people who are comfortable talking to walk-in clientele. And someone's going to walk up to you and go, so I'm going to go to the house. Can you tell me something and then, yeah, you know, right, and you go, okay, let me show you what we got. So let's turn these out. Well, we do flowers, perennials, and annuals. Then, then we have the bare wood tree side, and someone will show up with bare wood tree. We'll do bucket looking bags. And so we can sell side of trees in some houses. Last year, and you can sell as long as you're supporting. Last year, had um, we had what, 10 trees? Ten yeah. trees, something like that. But you can mind the rain. That's okay. It's all like trees. And a couple people come up and go, well, what's, what's going to do well in some? And the guy came up to me and go, my wife is going to be selling out the house in six months. That's fine. But in the meantime, you know, I'm trying to sell these trees. And he's like, no, no, I, she wants trees. And I said, okay, okay. She shows up, and she, she didn't even look at what they were. She just was, I want them. And I said, okay. And I got to tell you, if uh, if most of them sell, they will. So there's this thing in the world. I need to wear armor vests next time. But uh, so we, we need people to help them put water around, water the plants, and just sort of pick up these plants. But you want to tell me more about work? Well, I did just now with the guy. But, uh, there's so many different jobs. Crashers, crashing fences, uh, parking lots, and people that help take the plants out to the parking lot. Yeah. Well, so we have somebody standing by the door to deal with plants. We have people who can maybe uh, babysit plants so they can go get our plants. <laughs> So we have our master gardener and our advanced gardener who are in the world. So that's a huge area. Uh, last year we had two parties. Pretty much how it goes. So we'll have this tiny ground and this much out um, four hours each year on Friday, and then come back and do the four hours. A lot of people say, How do you know? The kid always do it. I can't work all of the almost the whole but all the other ones, so it's just that tough to keep up with it. So we're just going to learn. So much there. We'll be just busy in four hours each day and that afternoon. We do well for 10 weeks through, well to four, and then then I'll leave people in the afternoon also from six to seven, especially on the next day because my house is half ready to go. Um, so
So at the next Monday's class will be plant propagation. And Susan Allen graciously donated a very large box full of seeds for us. And it has everything from tomatoes, pepper seeds, it has potato seeds in it, okra, has squash, it has watermelons, cantaloupe, I think. So there's a whole variety of seeds in there. And I also have seeds starting trays and equipment for you for you all to take so you'll get a, a 1020 tray which is 10 inches by 20 inches it's called the 1020 tray and and i'll have uh, yeah and i'll have seed starting stuff in there for you so you get to you get to take that keep that what i would like is for you to grow enough for yourselves or your garden and but donate some back to the master garden plant set so i'll give you some equipment to start with and and hopefully that will help. So it should be a lot of fun at Kathy's class. Because again, that's going to be a hands-on class. And she has everybody do a whole bunch of stuff. And it's a good learning learning opportunity with Kathy Shreve. And Kathy Shreve, I, I swear she could drop a seed on the concrete and it would start for her. So she's quite the extraordinary master gardener. But yeah, it'll be fun. The, the plant sale is fun. This will be my 21st plant sale for the Master Gardeners. We started very humbly at the Botanic Gardens on the sidewalk between some shrubs. And just a couple tables and the back tailgate of a pickup truck. We 
we outgrew that slowly. It took a couple years to outgrow that. Then we moved to downtown Cheyenne on the plaza. We had tents, but the, the final straw was a snowstorm <laughs> where we were just desperately trying to keep plants alive and not succumb to the weather. And it was one of those days where it snowed on us, it sleeted on us, the weather cleared, and we all end up getting sunburned. <laughs> and I had a couple of master gardeners come up to me and go, never again. And they promptly found a place. They came up to our church, the M&K building. And I was just kind of dragging my feet on it. It's like, yeah, but you know, it's outside, it's festive. We've got all these vendors, it's a great time. And they were like, never again do I want to get snowed on and sunburned the mm -hmm. same day. So when we no sooner moved up to the M&K building at Archer, that that Master Gardener plant sale was a snowstorm and it was 18 inches of snow that first year, yep, and and I just sort of was very humbled by the whole thing. I was like, yep, we're never moving out of this building again, are we? <laughs> so we've been there ever since. We've been there for about 10 years now. It's 2009, it was John and Susie. So it might have been 2012 when we moved up there, but we've been up, yeah, we've been up there for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, we're never leaving. <laughs> We're never going back outside. A lot of fun, a lot of hard work. You'll be tired, but you'll have learned a lot. And you'll come home with some nice plants too. Yep. Other thoughts, questions? Okay. So everyone's got a snack. Someone's going to take home all the cookies and the brownies over there and that bread, or you haven't already eaten it. Anyone got little kids that you need to feed? <laughs> Drip irrigation. I have been doing drip irrigation for 18 years now. This is with the with the ongoing droughts in Wyoming, you have to use precision irrigation. You want to save water, you want to put the water right where the plant needs it, which is right at the roots, right? How many of you are using drip irrigation now? Okay. So for those. Soaker hose, okay. Soaker hose works too, but it's you don't know how much water is feeding that plant. You don't know how much water is leaking out. That's drip irrigation. It's just trying to keep cold rates. So trying to get you off of soaker hose. It's great to learn from. It's great to gain as a beginner, gain insight. But moving on to drip irrigation is a lot better. The only downside. Is that with soaker hose you can you can curve it you can make it roll around things right well with drip irrigation you just really can't but there's there's some ways around that so I'm a very linear straight line vegetable gardener but when it comes to my flower beds it's a whole different story I still use drip irrigation I just take a different tactic on it we'll cover that we'll take a look at how drip irrigation works. And of course, everybody got a drip irrigation drip works catalog, and we'll look through that catalog. This is a great way so that you can see and take home what I'm talking about. We're going to take this, we're going to unroll most of it, not all of it. We're going to take this bag apart and we're going to look at the components. Some of you have already put this in there. Put it together, we'll mess with it. And then I'm going to put everybody's name in, the, in my folder here. Everyone who wants to take this thing home. Because <laughs> I think the garden box, right? <laughs> Last year I watched Christy Bortle take one home. It was just sort of the strangest thing. <laughs> she was a very happy woman. So we'll put names in here and then some lucky person will get to take home. Thing they can't put back in the box. This is a very short lecture. 
I think drip irrigation is actually very easy to put together. If you can put tab A to tab B and screw an, an end on, you can do drip irrigation. It's just, there's just nothing hard about it. Just, it, it's actually very rewarding to put the whole thing together and go, oh, look, I did this. <laughs> so again, the benefits of drip irrigation, you're gonna put the water right where it needs to be. It's called precision irrigation. So important, so, so important. If you've got a vegetable garden and you're throwing the water up into the air like this, you are not getting water to where it needs, which is a risk to the plant. You're gonna lose 40 to 60% depending upon the day. You're gonna water things that you don't want to. You're gonna have more weeds, more disease pressure. This way you can reduce the disease and reduce the weeds and almost eliminate them both together. Okay. There's a couple ways you can do it. I usually just dead end my system. This, in this illustration, it kind of loops all back together and comes back at the same point. Not, you can do it, I'm not particularly fond of this. I like to run it and dead end it. That way I know that that end has got X amount of pressure and X amount of water is coming out of the drip emitter. So the drip emitters are gonna have certain amount of water per emitter. And it can be as, as low as a quarter gallon an hour. I like to go with a half a gallon an hour just because it's, it's more water over less time, right? I'm out in the county, I'm on a well. I don't wanna keep running my irrigation, my well constantly. I wanna only run it for a short period of time. I figured out when I had my big garden, when I was doing 5,000 square foot vegetable garden, it was costing me a dollar a day of electricity to water my garden. That's not a bad cost. You still need the grocery store, right? And that's the whole point behind this, especially for vegetables. You wanna beat the grocery store, but you also wanna do precision irrigation. If you're doing trees and you've got drip irrigation, that way you know exactly how much water you're giving that tree. And so a tree, and I think we talked about it at one point. The tree for every, uh, every inch diameter is, is 20 pounds of water. So the tree, you measure it from the ground up, put a couple of inches, this diameter here, Let's say it's 10 inches and it's easy. That's 100 gallons of water per, per week in a perfect world. This way, you know for the drip irrigation system. Oh, it's dollar. So there's a emitter that is going to be dollar per big emitter. Get them as big as 10 gallons an hour. Makes it easy. That way, you're not running your your well, or if you're in town, you're not running up a big bill, right? Because <laughs> the city water is getting expensive. This way, precision, right? In 2022, we got eight and a half inches of moisture for the whole season. Eight and a half inches of water. That is not much. That's, that's a severe drought. It really makes it more important than ever to know how much water you're putting out. So some factors to consider when you're doing drip irrigation, how much pressure is coming out of your hose bib? So when you, I have a frost-free hydrant, so when I pull, pull that thing up, I know I'm getting about 90 pounds of pressure when I open that up. That's a lot. Most of the time off your house hose bib, it's gonna be 45 pounds a pressure, that's about average, 45 pounds. Got to know what your well quality is. Um, city water is good water. The city of Shannon is really good water. Out in the county, you could be pulling up sand. You could be pulling up high alkaline, high salts. So you need to have your water tested. Know, what you're, know what's going on there. You have to have a filter. That is, that is an absolute must. 
and this filter, this little guy here, just unscrews. And it's it's done with such a rich line that it's certainly packed with I pulled around three of them from that pack and just kept it as well. Oh yes. Oh yes. If you're in town, those that filter is really important. Out in the county, it's it's critical. On the red line, I've got one at the house. I've got one because it goes up to my, I have a rainbird timer. So I have it before it goes through all the manifolds for the rainbird timer. And, and then I have one at each zone. I'm probably overkilling it, but these little emitters, I put things down and where I put them. This is what I'm talking about. These little, these little emitters here is a channel. And I'm going to start with David and have you guys. And then I have them up here. I haven't taken this part yet, but you can see there's a little spot. Those of you are familiar with this, it's a little spot. So take a look at that. If they get clogged, don't have that filter there, you're not unclogging your filter. So that emitter, that channel, is a kind of like a little labyrinth for water. And it goes like this. This is the tube. And the water goes in, it gets tangled up into this, it flows through this, and it comes out here at 0.5 gallons per hour. But if this, any place into here gets a little piece of sand or silt or anything, this guy. So really important to have those filters. They're not very expensive and if you go into your Driftworks catalog and go to page 10, they have a whole list of Different types of filters. You want to try to get one that's a 200 mesh. That's going to filter out the most amount of silt and sand, anything that the gets loose in the pipes and comes through. Or, you know, if you want when you water your plants in the house and if they've got kind of a white crust on them. That, that's all it's going to take to clog an emitter, a drip emitter. And they're not very expensive. They're $14 to $13. So it's, it's cheap insurance for your drip system. Very cheap insurance. So to this this tape here, I'm sending you now. This is ten miles thickness description of the ten description of the It 
it's so fragile. Have you just to attach the book? <laughs> the host there at the house or across the entire room, open it up. You will you will have a piece of water pitcher in your garden. So you do want to lift that structure down. So this is a 10 psi presentation tool. They're not very expensive. And once you give, once you buy this stuff, you, you've got it forever. They last forever. So on page 21 in your Dripworks catalog, I'm sure if you go through this a little bit more, you'll probably find more pressure reducers in here. I like to bring it down to 12 psi. I think 10 psi is a little restrictive. 12 psi should be good enough. So these little guys, about $14, $15. They're not very expensive. Reduce it down. And typically, I see on the drip works, they set it up so it's the filter and then the pressure reducer. And it always kind of surprises me because I, I would think that they want the pressure reducer ahead of that filter. And that's how I've set it up with my system. But I think either way works. And I think that filter can handle that PSI. That, that would be your consideration for that. Filter, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, you're just trying to pull those particles out and not let them get into those emitters. Yeah, this also helps reduce clogs. <laughs> this is this is just so important. So so important. Drip emitters. So there's different ways to deliver this water. And again, you can use the drip tape, but this is part of the tank. So, someone's going to want to put these down. Yeah. So these, these emitters here, these guys, come in different different gallon per hour leaks as well. What I see a lot of people do when they're when they set up their windbreak trees, they put in like one gallon an hour. Biggest tubing fine. I found that uh, this is great for gardens, but this wouldn't work for a tree row. It's too small. You're going to want to do capping. This would be too small for me. I'm just trying to find drip emitters, and I have found them at the big box stores. Where they're, I think they're from seven and ten gallon an hour emitters. But again, keep in mind that you want to irrigate in the time that it takes to irrigate. So you don't want to be running your well 24 hours. That is really hard on your well. And again, your your well, your pump. There's only a few times where it's going to go out during a snowstorm, a holiday, or when you have a house full of people. That's when they like to go out. Ours went out over Christmas. And that that was expensive. 
for those of you who live out in the county and have wells. <laughs> you're, you're all going to own that well. <laughs> then there is a, there's, this is a relatively new product. And I just love this. This is a This is brilliant. Now I can do that. And I can make this one box of my flowers with tiny bits. And I can take one of these emitters. And I usually get a, a bigger emitter, five gallon an hour emitter for the new 67. And I'll attach it. And then I'll take this and I will run it through my flower bed. And I will flower the bees watered on the one. So you can just get see 12 bees to set it up. You can use it for vegetables, meat, flowers. It's just not big enough for bees. Even bigger. Some fun in this is at the end of the season, I can pick it all up, I can get it out of the way, I can go back in and I can work the soil and put it up for the winter, put it down. My, my flower bed is just this big. This big. Yes, and here's the winter as well. Again, you can follow me on that. There you go. I just had that full of time. What's that? You can't remember. I encourage people to have less lawn, plant more flowers. Right? If you guys are master gardeners, you should save your lawns up and plant some flowers. I can just come on this and go, I go back to home. <laughs> yeah. But there are these, they have a three foot box on top of them. Or even So you just take that pop up head and you take you unscrew it and then you can put one of these pieces all the way on there. Then you can take this thing. Ones that were not in the ground, just little pop-up ones that we didn't 
have it in the So then I said, well, what should we buy? It's not very expensive, and I think you can just go to the big box stores and find it, but you just put it onto your book, post it, and that'll tell you right away. And I know that I know there's one of those in here too. Because I have one. They're not expensive. So once you really get into this, then you go buy a tackle box and you start putting all your irrigation stuff in there and you run around the property with your irrigation box and it's geeky and it's fun. Oh. Yeah, someplace in here there's a, a pressure gauge and you just screw it onto the hose bib, you open up the hose bib. And it tell, it doesn't leak water or anything, but it just tells you the pressure. Yep. And if you've got low pressure, I mean that's perfect for a drip system. Because you don't want and I have. I, I have blown them out and they become water features. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay. I I've I've done a whole lot of different things. Okay, so doing a design. I'm really not going to get into this because this is just makes you crazy. Know your soil. Know your soil because that soil is going to determine how long you run the system. And it's also, your soil type is also going to determine, you know, the time and the depth and how big your garden is. So there's a few factors in because People will ask me, well, how long do I need? Are you watering it? So I can't tell you because I don't know a lot of things about about your soil. That's more of an You guys should know this already. You've done a couple soil classes. Yeah, how long? How much water? I will I will email you this lecture so you can look at it. Because it gets pretty in depth about how far apart, how deep you want the water to go, how far apart your spacing is. I like eight inches on center for my drip, especially for vegetable garden. I can pack a lot of stuff in here. I can do tomatoes 18 inches on center. I can do corn eight inches apart on either side of this. I, I pack a lot into that vegetable garden. I expect my vegetable garden to work hard for me. It's a lot of information that's pretty esoterical, and we can get into it if you want to. Yep. Yep. My sheep. My sheep. So I plant it right at the middle. <coughs> you know, I want to water right in the rest. And then I'll cover this with black. This is the growing soil. I'll cover this with black plastic. And I kind of walk it. Then I kind of go away from that. And then, so when the front of the wall starts growing, it's really just having a certain amount of water. And I just cut a hole.
things to go at a time. So if I don't find something on the fridge, it's going to go off and something is going to go over the two or five on the floor, just turn it off or turn it on. But it gives me a lot more flexibility for the issues on the center. And then this should provide some counterintuitive information. Little dial that drops down on top of the screen. That just creeps down on top of the screen. How about mine? If you're wondering, I do like to see the mine. Mine is. You can't, you can't really do a good job of, of one of this the way. Over the Fourth of July, so it's like ready. And then, if you look at your I don't like spaghetti tubing. You just don't know how much water is really coming out at the end. And the same thing with the mini sprayers. You just have no idea of what the water volume is. And then you're watering the leaves and you're not getting the water down to the roots where it needs to be. So you're kind of wasting water with that. Yeah. Really? Okay, so on page 15, timers. They can be as expensive and as fancy as you want, or they can be as low tech as you want them to be. If the only thing you add to your garden is a timer, it is money well spent. The timer comes on when it's supposed to, it goes off when it's supposed to, it's X amount of water over a given time, comes on every other day, every day, whatever you want. They'll last you for a couple of years, so worth the money. And again, they're not horribly expensive. Here's one that even goes easy program flip open timer for $50. And they go up, they can be expensive. You can find them at the big box stores, buy for a little bit less money. But again, you can have as, as high tech or low tech as you want. So there is a timer with this kit. And it's got a B2 to it so you can. Yeah, they really didn't give me the choice. It's like, well, you take this time and an oval to get an apple. <laughs> Why? Do I need a time and apple? But I get the time and apple. This will never end. Okay. So who wants to help me put this together? Come on. I also need some of the pocket. No, just 
I found that too. Thomas, 
When you get to the end of the straight lines, you say, oh, they're going to they're stop the water from coming out. So there's these guys, and you just take this in here, cut this off, and put it in the other side. Take one of these ten sticks, put it through there, and over it. Because what this likes to do is when it gets cold, it does one thing, and when it gets cold, it does another thing. And so it moves around when you when you pour with that or you touch it. This prevents it from happening. Okay. Okay. This is all important for the end. So, Michael, I'm going to have you attach that. Again, it's just a quick couple. Now, I can't here attach this. This place belongs here. And remember, we have two plugs. So, if you ever take it this home, now this is all full of two plugs. Now, I need this. This is kind of hard to do. Yep, that's what you want to hear that snap. Now let's play it down with the ground and see what the birds think. Okay, so now you know this way is up. So right there, here. Yeah. 
regulator somewhere along the line um, so that you're not going to blow up this piece of the candle. Since they only have so much pressure on candles, so I have a bunch of different languages. <laughs> Yeah, this Anyone else want to There it is. My name? Yep. Okay. And the winner is? The winner is Bobby Jones. Oh, there you go. All right, everybody. Thank you. Have a good See you on Zoom on Wednesday. Do, do stay safe with the weather. And everybody who hung out online, thank you.
Peter trying to take her items away. Here's the